So good morning, everyone. Okay, that was a caffeine check and that was an epic fail. Let me try it one more time. Good morning, everyone. Okay, there is an audience out there, despite what the lights would, uh, would make you think. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to Forming, Storming, and Norming, Future Lunar Exploration Enterprise. Uh, we put together a very diverse panel today with uh, a variety of perspectives. Uh, hope to get into a little bit of a dialogue with everybody here uh, and, then, uh, and then open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, starting out, uh, I'd like to introduce each one of the panelists very, uh, very briefly. Each one will have a, a couple of minutes to make a few opening remarks. I've got some questions to get them started. So first up is uh, Dr. Clive Neal. Uh, he's currently a professor at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, we have uh, Marshall Smith, uh, serves as NASA's Director of Human Lunar Exploration Programs. Uh, Bernardo Patti is currently the Program Manager of the Human and Robotic ESA Exploration Program. Uh, Libby Jackson is currently the Human Exploration Program Manager at the UK Space Agency. Rob Chambers is a, a controls software and avionics developer, uh, but he is uh, currently the Director of Business Development at Lockheed. Uh, Brett Alexander, uh, if, in case you can't tell from the, the pin on his uh, shoulder, is, uh, he's served under different roles at Blue Origin for the past eight years. He's currently Vice President of Government Relations. So with that, uh, let me uh, turn it over and give uh, Dr. Neal a few moments to uh, uh, make a few opening remarks. Okay. Uh, okay, so I get to start things off. That's probably a good thing. Um, can I have my slide, please? Do I control the slide? Do I not control the slide? We control it. All right, there we go. Okay, so the instructions that I got and I followed were to have one slide and not talk for more than five minutes, but when you're talking about the moon, going back to the moon to stay, um, it may take a bit longer, but we'll do that in discussion. But uh, basically, you can see my points up on the slide there. I think if we're gonna go back, we need to learn from history and we need to show a big return on investment, the taxpayer investment if you're dealing with space agencies going back to the moon. Um, and that, that return on investment, I believe, it comes from resources, because resources will do two things. Uh, they will allow humans to survive on the moon, but in, in the near future, they will allow them to thrive on the moon, um, and also to enable going elsewhere. Uh, going on to Mars in a sustainable fashion if we develop the architectures to make use of resources. However, and we talk about resources a lot, we were in other, other um, panel discussions about resources, and uh, it's, a, it's a buzzword, resources, resources, but here in the geologic speak, are those resources reserves, and we really don't know. So if we want to figure out whether or not those resources are reserves, we need to get to the surface and do good old fashioned geologic prospecting. We need to figure out the form, we need to figure out the, uh, uh, with the extractability, we need to figure out the size of the ore body. Uh, and we need to know whether or not it can be refined and stored um, and whether or not it can be used. If you're dealing with water on the moon, we know that it's not just water. So uh, can we refine it? Can we use it? But we need to show that these resources are reserves if we really want to enable the, uh, the commercial sector to be part of this, uh, this uh, giant leap or this great adventure uh, as we go out to the moon and then on to Mars. Um, so, and again, after that, if you want the uh, commercial sector involved, what are the markets for these resources? We really need to, uh, to establish those markets because nobody's gonna go up there if there's a good reserve, if there's no, no market for the uh, for the final product out of those resources. So uh, I think human permanence on the moon would be go a long way to establishing those markets and go a long way to actually getting us off planet and then not only to the moon, but to Mars. Great, thank you very much. Marsh. Yeah, great, next slide there, thanks. So when we think about sustainability and the government, uh, you know, what we've been thinking about at NASA in terms of long-term exploration is several factors. Uh, one is fiscal realism. You know, we want to be able to understand how much it's going to cost. We want to be able to make sure that it becomes cost-effective as we move forward in time because if it's not cost-effective, we won't keep doing it. 
Um, we need to talk about private sector engagement. We want to make sure that industry is engaged and providing uh, capabilities that they're able to provide, and that factors into the cost of uh, fiscal realism factor as well. Uh, scientific exploration, you know, the things that Clive pulled on and that you'll hear uh, throughout this week, very important critical things. How do we use the resources on the surface of the moon? How do we use the resources on the surface of Mars, et cetera, as we as move, move forward? A healthy balance of technology push and pull, you know, uh, when, when the Apollo program was first started, a lot of things had to be invented. Uh, there's a lot of things that do exist now, so we, but we want to pull some of those along. Uh, there's some areas where we need to say we need these capabilities, for example, for ISRU, the things that we're going to need to go mine these resources or to make, make access to them. Uh, we want to push the industry in those areas. Um, architecture openness and resilience. One of the things that uh, we're doing with the gateway and the landers uh, is we really want to focus in on the open architecture capability. The interoperability standards that we've been authoring with the country's international community as well as our industry partners are key and they're building blocks to allow really anybody to, if they build to these standards, can come interface with the gateway, come interface with our landers, come interface with our power systems. If you want to land on the surface of the moon and you want to connect to our power system, you know, we this is how you do it. Those are, those are key points. If you want to come and enter our facility or, or someone else's facility, if we're all following the same standards, the same pressures, the same oxygen content, same dust ca capability and mitigation, then those, those systems will be compatible and we can easily work together as a, as a combined group as we move forward on our, on our development. Um, that will help us with our global co cooperation leadership. The more we work together, the farther we go. Um, I think those are very key points. Um, and as far as you, we want to continue human spaceflight, you know, I said it earlier in another presentation. You know, we went to LEO. We didn't abandon LEO. There's people saying, oh, we're going to go to Mars and we're going to go to the moon. We're going to go to the moon and we're going to go to Mars and that's it. That's not true. We're going to go to, just like we went to LEO, we're not abandoning LEO. We're developing a vibrant economy in LEO and we want to do the same as we move forward to. Uh, the, Mar the moon environment and cislunar environment, and then we'll continue on. And we're not going to leave the moon behind. We're going to continue to live and work and develop the moon and use the moon's resources as we then continue on to Mars and other deep space locations. So I'd say the biggest thing in my mind is, you know, really getting this repeatability, extensibility, taking the next steps to go to Mars when we're always looking to the next next foundation and building on what we've already done, I think is a really key point that will enable our lunar and Mars exploration. So with that, I think uh, I'll turn it over to Bernardo. Bernardo. Thank you very much. So uh, if I could have the, your ESA view graph. So this is the ESA exploration program to be presented at our next ministerial council. A uh, few words about it. Uh, it's articulated uh, on destination basis. Cornerstone 1 is human in Leo. Cornerstone 2 is the Deep Space Gateway, very much linked to Cornerstone 3, which, of course, is the lunar uh, uh, surface. And Cornerstone 4 uh, being uh, the Mars robotic exploration at the moment. Uh, this is complemented by transversal activities, which are science and technology, which are obviously uh, understood as a matrix element that uh, supports all the various elements. A uh, few words on what we think at ESA, uh, sustainability. So for us, a program which is, is sustainable is, well, let's put it this way, a program which is unsustainable is a program that collapses on his own weight. Uh, you could simplify the analysis and say there is an initial, initial investment, there is an exploitation cost, and there are benefits. When those three elements, sorry, uh, it shows that I don't have great experience uh, with uh, <laughs> uh, public uh, speaking. So, uh, yes, getting back to my point, uh, the three elements, the initial investment, the uh, exploitation cost, and uh, the benefit. When this balance is lost, the program is unsustainable and, sadly, is cancelled. We have plenty of examples this time. So, this is the definition of our definition of sustainability, but what, how do you achieve that? Well, there are tools for it. First, in no particular order, you have to make the right engineering choices, selecting the right technology, selecting the right architecture, uh, taking into account reusability. All those elements are key to, to cover a balance between the initial investment and uh, uh, the exploitation cost. 
The other element is also the right political choice to be made. So there is a say that, an African say, that uh, must come from some nomad tribe that say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Which, if you have to cross a desert, sometimes it helps. So uh, again, uh, for us, cooperation is an element of stability, is an element where everybody can play to his own strengths, together with also complementing each other with the similar redundancy. So if this is well architected, I think we can achieve to have a sustainable program independently of uh, the destination. So this is what we are striving for, and uh, we are working uh, every day with our colleagues and international partners to make sure that this is happening. Great, thank you. Libby. Thank you. So uh, I have the privilege of following NASA and ESA in the UK as a member state of the European Space Agency. Uh, really, I can just say what well, they said. We're, we're all working together and, and very much have a, a similar vision when it comes to Luna and beyond onto Mars. Uh, we have to make business cases to our treasury for anything that we do in space. We're, we're a, a few weeks away from the European Space Agency's ministerial meeting uh, where we all, all of Europe's countries get together and, and we give ESA some money and then ESA go on and, and we'll work with NASA and we will hopefully agree to go and be part of the gateway and going on. And when we make the business cases to Treasury, we have to make them on economic terms, on scientific return, which is key for the UK, and the inspirational benefits come in a part of that. Uh, so when you talk about sustainable uh, lunar exploration, it has to have a good business case. That's what's going to be there. That's what's going to enable the agreement of governments to provide taxpayers' money uh, to the space agencies to go on. We're only going to be doing, able to do that going forward if we work together and if we work with industry. And this commercialization is a very interesting and key topic to all of it. The big question for me when we talk about sustainable lunar exploration, we've had discussions in the panel, is, is how do you make sustainable exploration sustained? And I think those two words are sometimes getting confused or, or, or people see them as different things. Sustained means staying on the lunar surface for some time. Some people see it akin to what we've done on the International Space Station, where we've got continuous crewed people they have been there for nearly 20 years. Sustainable is something that fits within our exploration goals, within our budgets, and something that we can keep doing year on year on year. And for the moon, we see that very much as a stepping stone for that ultimate goal of Mars. So the moon should be something that enables us to go there, enables us to tr to try the technologies that we cannot do in low Earth orbit. We must only be doing the things we absolutely can't do anything anywhere else on the lunar surface because it's too expensive. And we always have to keep in mind that goal. So one of our concerns and one of our watchwords as we look at all of this is not to get stuck from a government perspective on the lunar surface. That plays into what everyone's been saying about um, bringing in commercial th people, bringing in resources. Governments can't keep um, paying indefinitely for the low Earth orbit and the International Space Station. They won't be able to keep paying indefinitely for the, the lunar um, orbit, the lunar surface, if we're to get to Mars. And that is uh, where we see the ultimate goal. Great. Thank you. Rob? Well, what a great segue. I was going to be apologetic for wearing a Mars tie to a lunar uh, panel, especially with Clive here. But you, you said Mars, so that's great. I didn't have to introduce it. The, um, you know, from a Lockheed Martin standpoint, we've been, you know, uh, with NASA on every mission to Mars, and we, we have that dead in our sights in terms of, of the end game. And our, our little Prince picture here um, is a, a little whimsical, but the, the path to Mars leads past the moon, and there's good reasons to go to the moon as well that we're going to talk about here. Um, but when it comes to sustainability, one of the, I cheated a little bit. Rather than describing sustainability, I said, well, what's one of the ways that you measure whether you've accomplished it? And it's, are you doing the things at the moon that you need to do at Mars? And when we break that down as a little bit of a, as an engineer, there's a propulsion element to this. Um, and uh, my new boss uh, is going to talk about that coming up here. Um, that there's a pull for the propulsion that we need to get to Mars. Uh, Artemis is a fantastic pull for that. Uh, cryogens is the future as we move forward. From a habitability perspective, of course, long duration habitats, whether they be orbital or surface, um, having those and having them be 
um, recycling to see the recycling symbol uh, in order to be self-sustained and not require. It's a very, very long logistics train out to, out to the moon and obviously even longer out to Mars. So we're going to be learning that at the moon. And as we get to the point where we can go to Mars, we will, by definition, at least in that regard, be sustainable. Um, the science, I mean, we, we talk about why we do all this. In the end, it's the science. It's where do we come from, where are we going, and are we alone, uh, as Grunsfeld would say. And so the science that we're going to do at Mars is no different than the science techniques that we're going to use at the moon, whether it's telerobotics, whether it's uh, with the field uh, geologists or selenologists on the surface, um, leading to the Ariesologists uh, at Mars. That, those science techniques um, have to be able to be performed with a long and thin logistics train, which means data processing and uh, deep storage and machine learning out at those locations. And again, that's part of that sustainment. We can't afford to put up you know, gigabit per second, um, some TBD uninvented communications path. Um, the scan guys would love it and it would be fun, but that's just not going to happen. So we're going to have to process that data locally. And again, that's part of being sustained. Um, infrastructure and operations almost speaks for itself. And the human experience is the part that is, um, it's the human part of human spaceflight. That's why I'm on the stage. It's the, uh, everything from, you know, biology and psychology and how we're going to choose these teams um, to just their autonomy and decision making in partnership with the robots. When we have checked off all five, and I, don't, I can't count them really quickly enough, but 10 of the small items, then by definition we'll have achieved sustainability because unless we are sustained in cislunar orbit, we won't be able to get to those, and without those, we're not moving on to Mars. Great, thank you. Brett. Well, thank you. Um, so at Blue Origin, our vision is millions of people living and working in space. And our, our real mission is to build those infrastructure and transportation capabilities to do that. Uh, what you see here is, is a key part of that. So we're building launch systems to get off of Earth, but we're also now um, pulling together a, a national team to make the Moon 2024 goal a reality uh, by bringing together Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper with Blue Origin to build the human landing system that will enable that last um, uh, key transportation element of returning humans to the moon. And doing so in a way that is sustainable by involving the private sector, by developing systems that can be used not only for NASA, not only for international science and governmental agencies, but also for the private sector to return to the moon uh, with government and turn uh, the moon into a place that has economic activity and economic value that then extends beyond government. We need to do that in LEO as well as, as we move away from uh, the ISS over the next, let's say, decade um, in, in turning LEO into a, a sustainable economic activity for human spaceflight. We need to do that as we move out to the moon so that we can then, as someone else said, you know, offload those activities and move on to Mars, but not forget them, not leave them completely out, uh, and not have them happen at all. So the key from a Blue Origin perspective on everything we do, um, building off of our founder's investment, uh, is to build products and, and transportation elements that are, by the definition, profitable and therefore sustainable, that they have markets, they have more than one customer, uh, they don't need investment to keep going. And by that doing that, we end up with an economic activity that leads to first tens, then hundreds, then thousands of people living and working in space on the road to hundreds of years from now where there are millions of people living and working in space. So with this national team, we're very pleased to bring together uh, the best of, of U.S. industry uh, to achieve that goal of Moon 2024, but do so in a sustainable way that leads to a long-term exploration of the Moon. Great, thank you. So the, the theme for us uh, today was uh, 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 forming, storming, and norming. And it's really about uh, how, we're gonna, how we're gonna get there and, where, uh, and uh, how we're gonna organize to get there. And so one of the first things you have to understand is what's the organizing principle? And so the first question I have, uh, and all these questions are jump balls for anybody on the panel, is why invest in exploration in the first place? I'm sure we have a couple of different perspectives on that. 
Well, I should go first on that, I think. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so exploration is key to our human experience. I mean, we, we ex we're explorers by nature uh, for the most part. And, and also in exploring, we learn more about ourselves, our, soul, our earth, what our future is, what our past has been. A and we really can learn about life and how it starts, how it begins. All of those things factor into um, our human experience. And that's really what it's about. It's not about just going to go someplace just because you're going. I think there's got to be a purpose and there has to be some, some thing that we're reaching for. And that, that's what I think we, we dri what drives us. And dri that's what drives me. Thank you. Okay. Well, we can think of three series of benefits. Um, political or philosophical benefits, it gives the identity of a nation or of a group of nations. This is important. The second is the science benefit, because exploration without science is not true exploration. And uh, the last element is, of course, technology and industrial growth. So those three elements put together and balanced properly are giving the right trust for a business case to our uh, decision maker. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Probably much better. You know, I'd, I'd add the, um, all of the money in the space program is actually spent on Earth. Um, we sometimes forget about that. Um, and there's no lunar economy unless there's like some rich lunarian on the far side. Wait, we're, we're um, putting a toll it's booth? It's moon economy. We're putting a toll booth right at Cis Lunar Space? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so the, uh, the point being that what we do in space, and it's not just about the, the finances, and it's not just about industrial base, um, but there, is, there are real technologies that we only build because we're forced to in order to do this. I was, I mean, we all live and breathe this stuff every day, and I was so struck at the opening ceremony um, by the Innovation Hall, I think it was called, and I was just watching the words go by, even the small font. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, that's what, oh, yeah. You know, everything from LEDs to, usually we roll out, Tang was the only one I didn't see on there. Um, they still sell that. You have to order it on Amazon, um, actually. The... Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but those spin-offs, and now, of course, spin-ins, um, are very fascinating. Those improve the way of life for us here on Earth. And while we know that, you know, without GPS, you couldn't get here, but we know without GPS, you couldn't run your ATM. Um, but there are other things that we have created solely because we had to in order to explore and push out. And, and so that, that benefits every single human being on the planet. You know, I think there's a broader reason for investing in exploration, both as governments and as companies. And I really, it, it's that Earth is a finite resource. And if you take the long view, because Earth is a finite resource in terms of, uh, um, from a pollution perspective, from an energy perspective, you know, we, we talk about a world where the entire planet would have to be covered in solar cells just to generate enough energy you know, for our population 100 years from now or a couple hundred years from now based on current popu or population trends and energy use trends. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, you know, you, you end up in a situation where you have a static world where you cannot have growth and you can't have energy consumption growth and, 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 and that's not a world that anybody wants to live in. But if we go out to space, we can get those resources, we can move heavy industry and other activities off of Earth. We can have a trillion people living throughout the solar system as opposed to, you know, 15 billion uh, on Earth in a very static world in which, you know, population and creativity and uh, and growth and, and, you know, continues to thrive as a species. So it's not, you know, really about each nation and what we can achieve, although it is, but it's not really about the discoveries that we can make, although it is, but it's really about our collective future and are we gonna live in a world that is open to limitless possibilities? And we have that for the first time ever within our reach just by going out and, and learning how to uh, evolve uh, a cap you know, set of capabilities to, to make that all within our economic sphere. Yeah, I just thinking about the, you know, how we're going to do this. Cooperation is the, is the issue. If you look at cooperation for long-term human space exploration, 
you look at ISS, year 20 is coming up. Uh, cooperation between nations, talking to each other, communicating, having a common goal. Uh, new industries come out such new origin. Lockheed, maybe not so new, but uh, Lockheed's there. Uh, I mean, but uh, if, you, if you look at the cooperation that's going on this time versus the last two times that we were going to go back to the moon, um, this time I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic because of the synergies and the common goals between nations or space agencies, but also between the, uh, the, pri the companies in the private sector. There's, there's much more interest in, uh, in, in getting back to the moon, but if you have a private company that wants to go to the moon, they want to see that return on investment. As a taxpayer, I'd like to see that return on investment from the space agency uh, dollar that goes into it. So seeing that agencies are now fostering uh, public-private partnerships and moving that, I think that's a fantastic development in terms of why we do exploration. Um, and the science is great too, don't, don't get me wrong, I love the science. Bring some more samples back. Buzz, you didn't bring enough, we need, we need more. Um, but uh, I think, the, uh, I think the, the issue is that cooperation between nations, between companies, for that common goal is why we do exploration and bring that return on investment. I, I will say, uh, I think my grandnephew summed it up even better, because it's fun. Uh, well, that, that too. Uh, so, uh, in opening remarks, uh, several of you uh, touched on one of the big themes that's come across on the sustainability. So I'd like to, I'd like to just give everybody a chance, let's put some definitions on the table. How do you define sustainability in Moon to Mars exploration? I went first, so I'll go again. So, so I think it really comes down to being repeatable, really to coming down, you know, can we keep going back and doing it again and again and again? Is it affordable? It, you know, I think, I think uh, Rob made a great point. And, and when we went and developed uh, Apollo, all that money was spent here on the United States and in, in the world, in America, as well as, and this is happening now across the globe, all those space agencies are doing this, they're investing in technologies and capabilities that have far-reaching impacts that we can't even begin to think of what, what may be in 10 years. Um, and I think those are key things, and of course sustainability, in my mind, back to that point, is we develop that technology, we develop that capability, we make things cheaper, we think make things more affordable, it becomes more accessible, then we get to where where um, um, Brett is talking about, where it's actually feasible to have tens of people living on the moon permanently, then maybe hundreds, then thousands, and, and we're not a one planet species. So that, that's really, in my mind, this repeatability. I just follow on there. Um, looking at the technologies developed to do these great things off planet, looking at the, the, the spin-offs back to the, to here on Earth, that becomes very important. How, how are what we're doing out in uh, the moon and onto Mars, what, what benefit is that given society back here? And I think we need to be very uh, conscious of that as we start to develop architectures and technologies is, well, what's the benefit for society back here? Because that will then get public support. Um, it, it shows the, the, the politicians that fund these space agencies that this is a worthwhile investment. And it then stimulates the private sector to come in and say, we, we want to be a part of that. Um, and I think that, that then forms that cooperative atmosphere whereby together we can go do great things. Um, and I think that's the important thing to foster. It creates a cycle that exactly. feeds on itself exactly. and grows. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me give you the view of a program manager which is dealing every day with the reality of resources and funding. Um, it's not necessarily boring. What I'm saying is uh, there is two ways to look at sustainability. The long-term sustainability involving energy, using of resources, ISRU, all that. But also the short-term sustainability because we have to get there first, okay? So if you look at the statistics, ISS is, cost is 70% transportation and 30% um, uh, infrastructure. If you go to the moon, it's going to likely be 85, 90% transportation, and 10% the rest on the first phase. Mars, even more exacerbated. Uh, therefore, the first step of sustainability, if we want the long term, we have to achieve the medium term, short term, is to have a tr uh, uh, an affordable transportation. 
it should be, as Marshall say, repeatable. And the big choice is there are two extremes. We do everything expandable, we do everything uh, reusable. If you do everything you re you're reusable, you have a massive uh, um, uh, initial investment that might discourage the taxpayer, the decision maker. If we are doing everything uh, 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 expendable, uh, you will find yourself a massive bill later on in, ex in uh, uh, um, exploitation that where the program might collapse on its own weight. So the right engineering choices, the right programmatic choices have to be found there. So this is, I'm sure, what uh, NASA uh, and ESA are doing on, on their side. What is the right balance between repeatability, production, reusability? And that's, at the end of the day, is providing the, the, the crude answer. Can we do it or can we not? Yeah. Uh, on the commercial side, uh, I actually heard uh, when uh, uh, Blue Origin founder Jeff Bezos was accepting the Collier Trophy, he made a point about this. Uh, and he said, you know, I, uh, specifically talked about, well, first he made the comment about as long as there's billionaires that don't mind becoming millionaires in the process, there's a lot of things you can do in the space business. But he felt that his business model was sustainable uh, simply because uh, he was creating one business to be able to fund the other, you know. Uh, and, and he saw synergies between those businesses that nobody else saw. Brett, is, is that manifested within the Blue Origin culture? Absolutely. We are very cognizant of the fact that we are very fortunate to have a founder that is able to invest in those basic capabilities. But he also drives us to make sure that everything we do is ultimately profitable. Doesn't mean you have to necessarily get a return on his initial investment. But what, you know, for our New Glenn launch system, that has to be profitable. We're not going to sell launches to the government or to the private sector at a loss. Similarly, with the human landing system going to the moon, we don't want it to be a one-off system, only usable one time or a couple of times, and it's so expensive um, each time. We want it to be a sustainable business because we want other activities on the moon. We want to have a large cargo lander that's you know, every time that uh, people go, maybe you have five to ten different cargo missions that go, put the infrastructure in place, the logistics, all the, the systems to start doing ISRU and science and everything else. So you want to build a system that is ultimately sustainable because it is, you know, not a, dra a, a drain on the resources either of the private sector or of governments too much too long. Great. And Rob, from a for-profit perspective. I would say as a uh, new space with heritage is how I, I, uh, I tried that at the Harvard Business School and they all laughed. Smart, but, um, we refer to it as smart space. Smart, oh, well, no, there's the, the uh, as Lockheed Martin uh, publicly traded, the um, uh, stagnation is death, right? If you are not growing, you're dying. And so one way, and it's tough to, that was, sounded negative, but there's a positive point here. The, the, it's hard to close a business case on your first vehicle or your first two vehicles or your first three vehicles um, if you're going to talk about the entire investment. So sometimes when we talk about sustainable, you know, we were talking about that with Leo commercialization just yesterday and, and um, you know, we're not going to try to pay for the entire space station's operating costs with commercial activities. That's not the point. The point is every time we do this repeatable mission, you do more for less money. The gradient is what's important here, or the slope. Every single time we go, we need to bring less with us and accomplish more and spend less and do it at a faster pace. Those things, that is by definition to us at least, is sustainability because you are heading down that gradient. And when you suddenly have become sustainable, you can't stop there, otherwise stagnation is death, right? And so to us, it's really, it's the journey and not the end state. Um, that really is what it is. It's, it's the, the slope that you get on and, and stick to. Oh, great. So uh, for my next question, let me first stipulate that an organization in a big white building with a dome up on a hill uh, southeast of us here probably plays a big role. We'll leave them out of this next question. What do you need from others across the space enterprise to make the missions successful? We, we need cooperation internationally through from governments to private sector. We, we have to come together to do this. The moon is hard. 
Uh, there are great benefits there scientifically. The technology spin-outs will come. We will see benefits back on Earth. But we have to come together to sell that to the taxpayers. Who, who, whichever way we talk about this and whichever way that the budgets and the monies run, you can't get around the fact that f for a while, for a long time, I suspect, that, that the buck is going to stop with the, with the public taxpayer. And, and you see that with the, with the, the commercial contracts as they are. We welcome the investment. We look forward to it. But, but you... We uh, in the UK have a, a great commercial communication system around the moon, which we, just yesterday ESA and NASA signed an, an MOU on this. But there is still private, public money going into that. We look forward to the day when it might be uh, receiving funds from other lunar missions. The chances of all those lunar missions being um, completely commercially funded, I think, are, are unlikely for a while. So we have to come together to make the case, to work together to make sure with it, that we get the best value for money, to make sure that we do something that makes sense collectively and that we can keep doing. I'm going to come back to that point to get us to Mars one day. Great. Anybody else? Yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, despite private investment, NASA is still the prime mover here when we talk about human exploration of the moon. Uh, from a Blue Origin perspective, we're developing Blue Moon, a lunar lander system of which the human landing system is based on. We would develop that system eventually, but we wouldn't be doing it on the same timeline, but for NASA's you know, uh, leadership in going. And the way NASA does that then is critical to future sustainability or, um, or the longevity of the enterprise because it needs to involve international partners but it also needs to engage the private sector in a way that allows them, allows the systems to be each mission costs less and does more. That it is on that glide slope, that gradient that, that leads to sustainability. I think if we look back in our history, you know, a Apollo was not that way. The space shuttle was not that way. After 30 years of flying the shuttle, you did not have a system that did more for less you know, at, at each mission going forward. And so the, the way NASA engages in the activity, who it engages with, you know, internationally and with the private sector, the contracting vehicles, all of that is incredibly important and essential uh, to be done right for sustainability. I think both of those are key because, you know, we, we can go fast, I think we said it, you know, we can go fast or we, uh, by ourselves or we can go far together. And I think that, Bernardo pulled on, and I think that's really key because, you know, yeah, we, we could go to the moon be done, be, and, and maybe support it for a little while, but in the long term, we're going to need to work together, and that's why when we look at the gateway and you work at, look at what we're doing with HLS and we look at what we're doing with the surface and things that we're talking about, that's, uh, that's going to take a lot of players, and interoperability standards are key to that, and being able to work together is the key to being able to spread the work that needs to be done, because it's a huge endeavor. It's not, it's a human endeavor as we move forward. I think that's key. Just, just quickly, I think it's cooperation, not competition. Right. Competition is not sustainable, cooperation is. Let me share a short analysis on what had happened on ISS. So on ISS, it's an incredibly ambitious project, several hundred of tons, size of a 747, 100 kilowatt, six crew living all the time. We had our problems. Uh, we lost some vehicle, we lost some crew, not necessarily on ISS, but in the same time frame. We had countries that had financial crisis. So all that is, was happening. So if there is not a critical mass of countries that compensate for each other with dissimilar redundancy, uh, with a uh, 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 different capability where everybody plays to its strengths, then we are weakening the process. This is far too big and for it too important to allow single point failures. So there is an element of stability on cooperation. Let's say everybody will have his, will have his rainy day and uh, then the other one are going to rescue the rainy day. So this is, ISS has given us the tangible example that this is happening and uh, well, we hope it doesn't happen, we don't need on the future, but the more we are uh, ambitious, the more uh, challenge will come. So, uh, in preface for my next question, uh, social scientists say there's, there's four 
uh, four elements to building, uh, and building and driving an effective team and building team cohesion. First one is a common friend, and I think we'd all say NASA is a good friend and common to... Well, I wouldn't to, go that far. Uh, well, <laughs> at least Marsh. I'll, no I'll give comment. him credit. Uh, second one is a common purpose, you know, and, and we've talked a little bit about the purposes behind that. And another one is a common uh, audacious goal. And the last one is a common enemy. So one of the things, Apollo was very successful because it had elements of all four of those things. The common enemy was the space race. But once you've achieved that one, common enemy has a toxic benefit, has a toxic side to it that tends to destroy teams over a period of time, and that's why you don't get sustainability at the back end. So between the common purpose, common goal, uh, and, uh, and common friend, the other thing we have to think about is who else needs to be on the team. So who else is critical to establishing a sustainable moon to Mars program? Who's not involved in the conversation yet? And we've seen a lot of stuff going on uh, here this week, but there's still more people that need to be involved. Yeah, I, I, I'd say I'm going to give you two answers. First, the uh, exploration of space is the greatest team sport ever invented. Uh, it's bigger than one company. You need the will and skill of everybody to pull it off. Um, so although we've got the a really cool wide range of folks sitting right here. We need the public. Um, this, by definition, again, is ultimately driven um, by the, the, uh, the governments, I mean, the taxpayers, um, for certain pieces of this to get certain aspects of the infrastructure in place, like Brett was saying. Um, and the other is, quite honestly, we need the millennials. Um, I missed the lunar landing. And I'm like, I've been pretty bitter about it ever since. So um, this is my chance now. The, um, but it's Mars and the true sustainability. This is kind of what Jeff said yesterday. You know, It's fun to listen to Jeff because he's like, OK, 300 years from now, here's what it's going to be like. My job isn't to create that. My job is to create the first step. And then you guys better not drop the ball. Um, and so this only becomes sustainable if the next generation is part of it, and that's why SGAC is so awesome here at IAC. So um, to me, the short answer now is uh, the public and the millennials. Can I, I'll say it, China. Let's say the C word out loud, get it out in the open. Um, I think China has proven its capabilities uh, with landing on the far side, robotically operating on the far side. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I know that there's a law here that prevents certain cooperations, but I think we need to get over that and work together because if we don't communicate effectively, then we'll start making stuff up about the other, other uh, um, capabilities or intentions. Um, so we need to communicate effectively between uh, all, all nations that are interested in going out into the solar system. And I think that becomes very important. And then just to mention again, the public, the general public needs to see the benefit of what we do. I, I want to pick up on the millennial point and go even further. It's not just the millennials, it's, I, and maybe you define it as that, but it's, it, it's the youth of today. To me, millennials means our, our graduates, we've got to go all the way further than that. And I, I am very aware as I sit here on this, this, this stage with, with, with what I'm surrounded by, and the images that the space sector projects and the space sector as a whole needs that next generation to come on board because space is absolutely fundamental to our everyday lives, not just exploration, but from our weather satellites to our GPS to the navigation. And we all have a role to play in making sure that the space sector is shown to be diverse and inclusive and welcoming to everybody. And we haven't always been because of how it was in the past. Uh, I am in the space sector today because I was not alive when Apollo happened, but absolutely that inspired me. Um, we had the first all-female spacewalk just a, a week or two ago. That was a wonderful piece of imagery. We have to make sure that we work to produce imagery of the space sector that is not as it used to be, but it's something that everybody can see and they can be a part of. And then as we talk about this exploration going forward, we will have the most diverse workforce that we can. Now I know why you got picked to run the UK Space Agency manned space program. <laughs> Renato. 
Yes. Human. Uh, new players. Uh, I think the agency are giving already an answer. We have an open architecture. Okay? So the open architecture is the answer that the engineers and the managers are giving in order to establish the priority, the possibility. Now, the policy maker and the politician will have to decide when the time are mature to take the right decision, and that's obviously that's not uh, agencies that uh, take those decisions that are taken in different offices. So, but still I would like to say that now there is a massive step ahead with the concept of open architecture that allows the growth that was precluded in the past. I, I would add that the, you know, I, I keep coming back to the private sector and other economic activity. I think that is enabled by the open architecture. I think that's enabled by uh, the way NASA is approaching it this time around. Um, and, and I think that that's important because you have to have other incentives other than, um, you know, exploration. You have to have things for people to do. Um, and, and, and in order to engage millennials, you have to get them to participate in a way that's not just looking at their phone to see a pretty picture, but is a is, you know, I have a role in that somehow and I can do that somehow. And in the past where we've had very few highly trained government, you know, astronauts who, you know, have spent 15 years to go off and do one mission for a week or something, that is not the, the going to be sustainable in the future if that's the vision of engagement or participation. We need a lot of people doing a lot of different things uh, and following their own interests as well. I think we're going to look back in, in 20 years and realize that one of the most pivotal aspects of exploration and space um, was the invention of the CubeSat. Um, when I go out and interview, I am so glad I don't have to like re-interview for my job every year because I would never get hired. These the, the kids that are coming, young people that are coming out of school now are like building spacecraft and flying them. And so the reduction in that barrier of entry, and we were flying 13 CubeSats on EM-1, Artemis-1, the, um, the, the ability to reduce the barrier of entry and allow the participation, not just virtual reality and looking at the pictures, but to actually build something that, that is launched from that system as it's flying through space, that's, that's not just participation, that is actually contributing. And, and the fact that you can do that as a college student now blows my mind, and I think as we look back, we're going to realize we just went through a singularity. And I'll get more directly to your question. Those first three, I'm all on board with. I don't feel like, I think, I think you made a good point at the end of your question where you said something about competition leads to, you know, when the competition's over, what do you do? It falls apart. And, and to me, this is not about competition. To me, this is about taking the next steps in our journey as humans and what we want to go do in space. I think Bernardo said it right. I'll leave it to the policymakers to go work out what they've got to go do. Or my job is to go and engage and make things happen for our goals as we want to move forward to the moon and beyond. Sounds good. So uh, before I ask my uh, closeout question, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, I don't know how to... You've got a nut loose on the keyboard up here, so I don't know how to get this to the uh, uh, to the audience question page. I can do that. We'll get you a mic, Buzz. Uh, Ed, does that include uh, uh, suggestions? For you, yes. Yes. Anything you want, Buzz. I mentioned uh, yesterday in Space Exploration Enterprise Alliance, and in lieu of a gateway, the first couple of elements can be used for a trans-orbit craft between low Earth orbit and lunar orbit that can take an Orion along with the trans-orbit craft. Obviously, it can't do that on uh, SLS to lunar orbit. So of the period building up, we need two launches. 
a medium heavy, Falcon heavy and Duke Glenn or some mixture. When Orion comes back and lands on the Earth, the transorbit craft comes back with solar electric propulsion on a slow orbit back to the Earth orbit, comes back into the next orbit that will go to the moon. Eventually, we replace Orion with something that can aero capture and can be reused in low Earth orbit. Now, these two launches can be used to get the lunar module up there to run it through its tests. And we may need to get a separate lunar module up there before we get the first Orion for a dry run and then Orion for a crewed run. Now, I have a question for both of you. Uh, South Pole or North Pole? Uh, I don't know whether North you... Pole. Pardon? North Pole. Very good. Dennis Thank you. I, I pass. <laughs> Do you agree right with answer. Dennis Wingo's analysis? I, uh, I, I think that um, you have more accessibility to, to water ice at the North Pole. And, and I'll follow up on that, Buzz, in that we've been directed to uh, uh, head to the South Pole, but the, the beauty of the architecture that we've laid out in our baseline approach is that we can actually, it's a spacecraft, it's not a station, it can be moved around, we can bias to the North Pole should that turn out to be the better location to go. So, so those are still, uh, if, if the scientific community can, we get that case made, then we'll have those discussions. The other part of that is I'll, that we're in a blackout period on wh where we're going with the contract, but we have made it so that uh, other architectures are certainly up for option and they can propose those architectures and we will evaluate those accordingly. Well, I like the sound. I just want to follow up with the North Pole idea. South Pole, if you're going to go to Shackleton Crater where we think there are extensive water ice deposits, you can land in the sunlight, but you've got to go down 4.2 kilometers down a 30 degree slope to get to them and work in 40 Kelvin. If you go to the North Pole, there's Peary Crater. Peary Crater, if you look at the data, it looks much better at the South Pole because LRO has a much closer orbit around the South Pole versus the North Pole. Peary Crater is partially shaded. You can land in the crater in sunlight and you can go in and out of PSR with a very minimal slope and you can explore that properly. Um, and I think that that's something first step if we're going to do uh, prospecting on the moon. That would be the first step to go prove the technologies that are going to do the prospecting in a, in a relatively benign uh, area before we start going to South Pole and looking at uh, the slope and the distance issue. And the other thing I would say the gateway approach gives you is it gives you global access because it's not just about the North Pole and South Pole. There's a whole lot of moon to, to, to actually uh, to explore and discover. Right now we're planning to go to the South Pole and as we move forward we'll, we'll see where the next places are that we want to go. Yeah. I'm almost liking gateway now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, bring, we'll bring you along. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it, the, the ability to consider alternative architectures and to and uh, I think the openness of the BAA that's come out, I think, is a tremendous opportunity for people to be able to propose alternative uh, architectures. It'll be interesting to see what comes in. Bernardo, did you have any? Well, the remark I can make is, yes, you can see landing on the moon is like an inverted launcher, right? Uh, uh, and uh, now there are plenty of books that say that a launcher must have three stages, okay? and um, there's not big discussion about it. Now, landing on the moon, you can have all the permutation you want. And you can study another 20 years and st find still a, a, a best one after. I think now it's time of convergence. Uh, we have studied that to death. We have identified a baseline that we think is sustainable and viable. Let's try to improve it, maybe. but. Let's transition from being student to being engineer and building things. Uh, there is an urgency. We have to go there. We have to build stuff. So at some stage, the discussion has to finish, and the, uh, we have to cut aluminum. 
uh, we cannot argue that we have rushing that. We have studied that enough. And now uh, we are very happy that what NASA is doing, putting the contracts ahead, signing contracts, and uh, uh, creating a pace. And I agree, maybe the solutions are not perfect, but they will fly, and we will make them perfect when they fly, and then there will be other version that will event eventually uh, 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 do the right iteration. But I think we should privilege the building rather than the discussion. Yeah, I, I think that's a key point when you say that there's, there's more than one way to do things. There's not a perfect way. We need to pick a way and go because we need to take the steps that Brett's taking. We're not going just once. We're going again and again and again and again. We'll be able to explore other parts of the moon. We'll be able to go find out what resources we can use and how to use them and, and, and see other architectures as commercial comes along. They'll, they'll offer new capabilities that we can then use in different ways that we can't even imagine today. And that doesn't mean jumping too early and too short means that we shall say, have we studied that enough? Have we turned all the rocks we had to turn? There are probably some other things that we haven't seen. Fair enough. Okay, that's a way like that. Uh, the better is enemy of the good. And also this we have to think. Uh, that's the way we are trained to think, uh, engineers and managers. So I think that's the way we, we suggest we should go. And that's what 2024 does for us, for NASA, to, to say, yes, let's, let's go. Let's do it. The time yeah. is now. So my last question, uh, and uh, I'm going to put it in personal terms for most of us, uh, uh, but also in technical terms. So uh, we all know that uh, you know the least energy, uh, the planets align properly, least energy uh, to get to Mars every about 11 years. There's an opportunity coming up in 2020, uh, 2033 for those least energy trajectories. So uh, rather than picking a five or 10 year window, I'm going to pick 15 for two reasons. One. I'm in my 60s, I'll be in my 70s, I'll probably still be kicking. Uh, and number two, uh, 15 years, we will have had that at least energy orbit. Define success 15 years from now from your perspective in the Moon to Mars initiative in 15 years from now. We'll start with Brett and work our way back. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a lunar guy. Uh, you know, by, uh, by bias. So success for me means uh, tens of people living actually, you know, sort of permanent presence on the moon, uh, ISRU activities that are generating propellant, whether it's economically viable at the, yet or not, I don't know, but, but robust activity that spans uh, the U.S. internationally, uh, private and government, and, and there's multiple missions. Uh, on an ongoing basis. Rob? Yeah, that, that picture right there, only with like a blue moon on the bottom and a Lockheed uh, thing on top on the left. The um, humans and robots together, you know, we talk about collaboration. Um, the silicon-based life forms, we need to collaborate with them too. The, the robots and humans together are going to be accomplishing things that we can't even dream of. I mean, we're we're going to fly a helicopter in Mars in 2020, and we're going to put, um, we get to work on this one, Dragonfly at Titan. Uh, those are going to be transformational when you put the human in the loop. And so um, when we are on Mars and walking beside our, our rover, rover and, uh, and flying helicopters um, around and hypersonic UAVs uncrewed to get regional coverage, that's where we want to be in 15 years. We can do it. We got the technology. I would say an international collaboration, both between countries and then also with, with private enterprise. Something that in 15 years' time still allows me to have a budget of, of my successor, um, that we can continue making a case to the taxpayer that this is good investment, that we are seeing a return terrestrially, that this is not just money going after the fun things, but that we're seeing benefits on Earth, and that we're seeing good scientific results. We're going after the places that the scientists want to go to to unlock the questions that we've all got that, that bring us the, the science, the technology, and those inspirational benefits that will keep feeding our industry. The, the, the space exploration, we are the poster child of the space sector. We're the ones who go and, and, and really get out there, and, and I could, would bet that many, many people in this room uh, get into this because of what astronauts do. 
And so we've got to keep doing that, and it comes back to that word, in a sustainable way um, that taxpayers agree with. Bernardo. Thank you. Six. Six. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, go, and I'm gonna echo a little bit what Brett said. Um, you know, success to me is, is a, a vibrant economy in the lunar area. You know, in 15 years, it took us a long time, and we're not quite there yet. We're getting there for a vibrant economy in low Earth orbit. That's, that's partially because we started from nothing. Now we're not starting from nothing. When we go to the cislunar space, um, we've got a space econo economy that can rally behind that. And in 15 years, I hope that it's actually a vibrant economy, that we're living and working there, and that governments can then turn their sights on Mars, and by the 2030s and the mid 2030s, or, or somewhere in that time frame, we're doing what you see in that picture. That's what I see as success. All right. So, you know, I saw the first 12 humans walk on the moon. I wasn't very old, but I was around and remember it. But uh, I want to see the 13th, um, and I'd like to see the first human walk on Mars. So I'm a lunatic. I'm a lunar guy. Everybody who knows me knows that I moon first. But I'm working with uh, um, the Explore Mars group, working together to look at the synergies between Moon and Mars. Focus on those synergies, cooperate with people who used to be fighting a little bit, but we cooperate now to look at how can we use the Moon to go to Mars. Um, we don't abandon the Moon, and sorry Libby, I hate the term stepping stone. It me means you leave it behind and abandon it, and it just, yeah, sorry. Anyway, uh, we'll talk afterwards. The, uh, but, 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 the, but the important, the, the important thing is, is that if we look, for, look at history, this year we celebrated 50 years since Buzz walked on the moon. And it, an amazing feat. But this year, in December, we celebrate 47 years since the last human left the moon. We don't want to make that mistake again. We abandoned a lot of capability there. We're now trying to get it back. We've, we're now learning from that because we're talking about cooperation, not competition. We're talking about um, you know, sustainable and whatever your definition is. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm very excited about what my grandkids are gonna see. Very excited. Yes, thank you. Yes, along those lines, some of us are waiting these days since 20 years. So, um, with all the respect to ISS. Uh, I've been, I am the program manager of ISS since 10 years, and I love this program uh, so much. However, beyond LEO, the exploration is there. We have been waiting so much for this to happen. Now we have an opportunity. We go to the moon, we return for the first time samples from Mars. There is a decade ever so rich of challenges opportunity that is really a system engineering paradise uh, that uh, uh, we have ahead of us. And let's take the opportunity and take the challenge. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I was reminded I didn't actually introduce myself earlier. My name is Ed Swallow. I run all the civil space programs for the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, and, and I'm gonna, uh, I'll add uh, my vision for 15 years from now. And that is I get to watch somebody step on the surface of, the, of Mars and say, one small step for a human, one giant leap for humankind. And with that, thank you very much. Round of applause.